Hi there history fans, so today we have the video called The World War II Japanese Soldier Who Didn't Surrender Until 1974. Um, yeah, this video was recommended by somebody in the comment section, so if you want to uh, suggest something just put it down in the comments below. Uh, I think I do two or three videos a week from the comment section, so just write your suggestions down. Okay, this is a video from Simple History, I already covered I think two videos from them. Uh, if you don't know their channel, you should know if you love history. Um, I'm just gonna put the original link uh, in the description below. Go give them a view and a like, check their channel out if you don't know them, but they're a huge channel on YouTube, so you probably know them. Uh, give them a view and a like. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give some of my thoughts, opinions, whatever. Uh, if you want to correct me, add something interesting or, or some things that you know, just put them down in the comment section below. If you want to be part of our community, uh, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Okay, let's go. Let's see what they have Put to there. you by Skillshare. Hiro Onoda, the Japanese soldier who didn't surrender until 1974. Hiro Onoda was a Japanese intelligence officer in the Imperial Japanese Army who refused to surrender until decades after World War II had ended. In the Pacific Theater, there were many Japanese holdouts holding Zanryu Nipponhe, or remaining Japanese soldiers. They were motivated to continue on after the surrender of Japan in August 1945 because of their dogmatic, militaristic indoctrination or simply because they were unaware of the surrender. Hiro Onoda was trained at the Nakano School as an intelligence officer where he was taught guerrilla warfare and intelligence oh. gathering. Onoda was... Yeah, he, as an intelligence officer, he probably was kind of, um, you know, like dedicated to the political ambitions of Japan uh, back then. Because as far as I know, and I know more about, you know, like European uh, uh, secret services during the Second World War, uh, but in... In order for you to be an intelligence officer, you needed to show not only skill uh, on the battlefield and with information warfare or whatever, but you should uh, you needed also to show political loyalty. So those men in Japan were probably pretty pretty loyal to to you know like the the, the political ambitions uh, of Japan back then, and. I'm kind of not surprised that he was a, 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 a intelligence officer. Sent but to okay. Long Island near Luzon in the Philippines in late 1944, Don't where he would soon meet is. up with a group of other Japanese soldiers already on the island. Mijiyoshimi Taniguchi had given him orders to live off the land and forbade him to die by his own hand. He would further reassure Officer Onoda by saying, it may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we'll come back for you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you are to continue to lead them. Higher ranked officers in the group made Onoda unable to carry out his mission to sabotage the enemy airstrip and pier at the harbor. This in turn made the US conquest of the island, which was achieved in February 1945, easy. Once US forces were on the island, the large group split up into smaller groups of three to four men and escaped into the jungle and were either picked off by the US troops or surrendered until it was just Hiro Onoda and three others under his command which were left active. Private Yuichi Akatsu, Corporal Shoichi Shimada, and Private First Class Kinshichi Kozuka, all of which had set up base in the mountains. After Japan... Uh, I mean the fighting uh, on uh, in the Pacific uh, between the, the um, uh, Allied forces, especially, I mean, American uh, forces and Japan, was actually pretty, pretty, pretty hard. Um, the Americans suffered a lot of a lot, a lot of casualties by you know like just taking small small islands, and the thing is, uh, the U.S. yeah they they were uh, uh, dominant or on the on the um, uh, with their navy especially after the the Battle of Midway, but you know like every time when you jump from one island to another. You always need to, what is it called in English, like, you need to make an amphibious, I think it's called amphibious, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, landing. So you need to always go out on the beach where you're vulnerable, vulnerable 
uh, uh, the enemy is already dug in, they know the terrain, they, they put out, uh, you know, like uh, trenches and, and secret, you know, like small booby traps and whatever, mines. So every time when they, when, when they invaded those small islands that will ha were held by the Japanese, the casualty numbers were, were pretty, pretty high. And that's something that's not that much talked about in Europe. Because, uh, as I told it already, uh, we mainly, which is kind of also logical, but we mainly focus on the European theater during the Second World War and what happened here. But yeah, guerrilla warfare uh, uh, like this, you know, like living on the, uh, off the land, uh, uh, just hiding on the bushes and the hills, Shuma Maigorama in Croatian, Serbian, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the partisan movement, so resistance movements also throughout Europe. So the, that was also the thing in, in, in here. Japan had formally yeah. surrendered in September 1945. Onoda and his group came across a number of leaflets. The first leaflet left behind by locals was discovered quite soon, reading, the war ended on August 15th, come down from the mountain. However, they concluded that it was an Allied propaganda trick. After this conclusion, the group continued to raid local islanders for food and other resources. General Tomoyuki Yamashita of the 14th Area Army also dropped leaflets from the air with a surrender order. But again, the group decided that they were a trick. With a <laughs> lack of knowledge of the atomic what? bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it may have seemed more unlikely that Japan was willing to surrender. In 1949, Yuichi Akatsu escaped from the group and surrendered to Filipino forces in 1950, causing the remaining three to be cautious to disloyalty. In 1952, the search mission was expanded with letters and pictures from the group's families dropped from an aircraft, but again, this was wrote off as a trick by the three soldiers. Just imagine how, how much how much effort those people put to, you know, like inform those guys, hey, stop shooting at 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 local people just crazy but i mean uh as he was an uh, intelligence officer it's kind of not surprising that he dismissed those letters on and those information as enemy propaganda because in their let's call it education school whatever they were tho told, you know, like the enemy, the Americans, whoever, they're going to use everything possible uh, to, to, you know, like make you desert to them, to surrender to them and whatever. So I'm kind of not surprised that he already had in mind that the Americans would try to do something like that and that they're doing it now. Every piece of evidence the group came across increased their paranoia and hostilities. While they were dressed in their imperial Japanese uniforms, the people they came across were in civilian clothing, which they interpreted as allied soldiers in disguise with the strategy of luring them out. Bruh. As a result, they didn't think twice when firing on the locals. Corporal Shoichi Shimada was shot in the leg but recovered with the help of Onoda in 1953. 1953, so they're, <laughs> they're already eight years on that island. And I don't know why, 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 the, why the, the, the Philippine government didn't actually just, but maybe this, this is the army, but why did they didn't just send an army to eliminate, eliminate those two, three guys? Just hunt them down the hills and the forests and, and eliminate them. But on May 7, 1954, he was killed by a search party when he fired upon his potential ah, rescuers okay. who so returned fire on a beach at Gonten. Send a now parties. just two remained. Onoda and Kozuka would continue the mission to sabotage, gather intelligence on, and attack the enemy which no longer existed. But on October 19, 1972, during a skirmish, Kozuka was shot and killed by the police when he was burning a farmer's rice collection. Lieutenant Onoda was now alone. On February 20th, 1974, a determined Japanese explorer called Norio Suzuki found Onoda. Onoda still refused to surrender. However, Suzuki had the idea to locate his original commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Tanaguchi. In March 1974, his former commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Tamaguchi, traveled to the Philippines to fulfill his promise to return and end his orders in person. Onoda, still wearing his tattered army uniform from decades 
So, so the officer was also still alive. Nice. It's a go. Saluted the Japanese flag. What do you think? W would he surrender if if he didn't see the officer? And especially ima imagine this scenario: the 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 whatever researcher who who found him that he told him like, yeah, I'm gonna bring you back your officer, and he's gonna tell you, you know, like that the war is over. And then I don't know, a year goes by and he returns without the officer. Would it be propaganda? Would he think like, hmm, you're an American, uh, you know, like ally, whatever, you're trying just to, to, to make me surrender. And handed over his samurai sword, his functioning Arasaka Type 99 rifle, several rounds of ammunition, hand grenades, and his family dagger. Where, where the hell did, did he uh, have, you know, like the ammunition to hold up for, I don't know, like 30 years? You know, like you need to be actually pretty efficient with, with your ammo <laughs> and the rifle is still working. Like, wow. And he also had grenades. The Philippine government under President Ferdinand Marcos granted him a pardon, taking into consideration that although he had killed 30 innocent people during his campaign on the island, he thought the war was still carrying on. When he returned to Japan, Onoda was very popular, but he found <laughs> it hard to adjust to the new post-war Japan and the decay of its traditional values. He published an autobiography and in 1975 left Japan for Brazil, where he raised cattle and later opened a series of training schools. In his last years, Hiro Onoda said in an interview, every Japanese soldier was prepared for death, but as an intelligence officer, I was ordered to conduct guerrilla warfare and not to die. I became an officer and I received an order. If I could not carry it out, I would feel shame. I am very competitive. This video was uh, yeah, let's made work. possible by Skillshare. Yeah, the thing is, the thing is, um, if you look at Imperial Japan when they were uh, building their their you know like uh, imperial ambitions and, and so on, they went back to the old Japanese traditions of you know like bushido honor whatever blah blah blah, and. Uh, and that that is something in the Bushido codes, you know, like not surrendering, fight till the end, f uh, no, don't bring shame to the people, uh, to your family, and so on. So all the old traditions were reinstated, and he joined the war with, you know, like with with the world around him in that kind of sentiment, in in that in that let's call it order. But when he returned, like thirty. 30 years later on and you know like you had the 50s the 60s and now the beginning of the 70s mid 70s the the, the technological adv advances throughout uh, the world and especially Japan because Japan went uh, through a, a reconstruction uh, by um, uh, General McCarthy and the American op occupation so you know like they started you know like the big companies uh, and they industrial industrialized even more and more and modernized and opened up to the world so you know like you had big influence from the from the west coming and their influence and japanese you know like products and influence also going throughout the world so it's not hard to understand that he was you know like shocked and because he left a world that he knew and returned to a world that he barely knew just put yourself into his shoes. Uh, but yeah, very interesting. Nice. I like to learn about the Pacific, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, like battles in World War II because uh, I just only know the big ones, you know, like Midway, Iwo Jima, Pearl Harbor and so on. So it's kind of interesting, but uh, it's also hard for me to comprehend, you know, like where where is this island? Or, or he said like Philippines, but still, you know, like, Philippines has a lot of small islands and big islands. So uh, I think that people from, from that part of the world and maybe America maybe know more about this guy or whatever. So if you know something, if you want to correct me on anything, let me know in the comment section below. If you want to, uh, you know, like suggest a video, just put it also in the comment section below. Okay, uh, this was a um, suggestion by the comment section. And that was for today. See you until next time.